Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, so, John Burr, I'm lead enterprise architect at the Combined Authority. Um, we're going to go through a bit of a presentation on, on what we're doing around full fibre and um, and what we're calling GM1 network uh, in the city region. Uh, we are recording this event, uh, so we'll be sending a link around afterwards. And uh, there's a lot going on with digital leaders this week, uh, so probably everyone's attending lots of different sessions. Um, so. Um, as I say, we're going to go through a few slides, um, a video as well, uh, and then I've got some colleagues that are going to join me for a bit of a fireside chat on on their views of um, how networks like this can can make a real difference in in the public sector. Uh, so I'm going to start off with uh, a bit of a video that we, we've put together. Uh, hopefully the audio will play through. Please shout out if the audio doesn't play, uh, and then we'll carry on with the slides. Greater Manchester has the fastest growing digital economy in Europe, contributing over £5 billion a year to our region and to the UK. Across the country, the digital economy is booming and Greater Manchester is right at the heart of that. We have an ambition to become a world leading digital city region and we're already well on our way. We've got a can-do spirit, and we're not afraid to lead in areas like using digital infrastructure for the benefit of our people. Here, we're tackling digital inequality. If Greater Manchester is truly going to be a world-leading digital city region, we have to make a big commitment to fix the digital divide and ensure all of our residents have the ability to get online, because the consequences of not doing so are severe for us all. We're a place that puts people at the heart of our plans. Greater Manchester is doing digital differently. We're working towards making Greater Manchester a world leading digital city region. And I'm fortunate enough to work with a lot of really brilliant and committed people across the whole of Greater Manchester to make that happen. But we're not interested in technology for technology's sake. Our digital priorities in Greater Manchester are centred on our people and about making a difference. And we're delivering benefits that help everyone lead healthier and happier lives, like ensuring that Greater Manchester has the digital infrastructure it needs to be that world-class digital city region. And this is much more than about putting cable in the ground. We're building better foundations for digital public services and creating opportunities for wider connectivity and for our residents and businesses. And over the last two years, we've seen real life examples of the impact that this is having. We've been able to provide free high speed connectivity and Wi-Fi for a range of community sites across the whole city region for five years. And we've already seen over 20 million pounds of local economic and social benefit from this. Like local people using this connectivity to access online services like banking and GP appointments, developing digital skills and learning how to use the Internet safely which is more important than ever in our increasingly digital world. It's also given young people more places to get online and complete their homework. But this is just the beginning for Greater Manchester. We're at an incredibly exciting point. And as we come out of the pandemic and we look ahead, we're set to become a world leading digital city region. So obviously you're hearing from, from Andy Burnham there and, and Phil Swan. Um, and it's, you know, we, we use this a lot about doing things differently uh, and that applies to digital um, more than as much as any other area. Um, and the key thing about the city region is, you know, we're big enough to matter and, um, you know, we have a population of 2.8 million people, um, but we also know each other really well. Uh, it's a really good collaboration across all public sector organisations and we're also driven enough to make things happen and that really leads from the top as well uh, as you as you've just heard and um, so both with with Andy as mayor but also the portfolio leaders uh, so we have a, a, one of the leaders of the council um, it's our digital portfolio lead and we also have a chief exec and they really champion the digital agenda right across uh, the city region and as an area as well, you know, we've got the biggest digital uh, and creative cluster outside of London and it's growing as well significantly. As an organisation, um, 
GMCA works alongside uh, the 10 local authorities uh, in particular, but also we have really close relationships with the other PAN GM organisations like transport, police, um, and what will be the, the GM ICS from an NHS perspective. But we also work alongside education um, and some of the central government organisations, particularly the likes of DLUC, uh, GCHQ and NCSE, um, who recently opened quite a number of their offices in the area. And in February 2020, uh, just before the pandemic, we launched our, our digital blueprint, and this really sets out the priorities for digital across the whole region. It's not a GMCA strategy, it's, it's a wider GM and signed up to by all of the leaders uh, across the local authorities. So that just kind of sets some of the context. What we wanted to talk about today in, in a bit more detail is what we're doing with uh, full fibre uh, and how we're looking to make best use of that. So the city region was successful in a number of bids into the Department for Culture, Media and Sport um, around providing um, full fibre programmes um, across three specific areas. Um, so there was an, around 21.3 million uh, of DSMS funding that came in uh, to the area and that was topped up uh, by the Greater Manchester uh, local authorities involved. So around 30 million pounds worth of investment. And that was looking at deploying dark fibre, particularly um, on the public sector and contingency, uh, where we using the capitalisation existing spend to have a right to use dark fibre for up to 30 years. The main aim behind this was to move GM from where it was at the time, uh, for three or four years ago at 2% full fibre coverage up to 25% within three years. Um, we've actually exceeded that. We've seen a lot more growth in full fibre across the city region during the LFFM programmes. Um, there was other, two other programmes that were involved in that as well. So uh, Manchester City Council uh, was successful in a public sector building upgrade, which is meaning putting fibre into an, a large number of those sites that were predominantly copper based historically. And then Tameside um, have been working on a cooperative network approach for a good number of years now, and uh, they were successful in further funding to expand that full fibre programme. Looking at the, the public sector and tenancy programme in in a bit more detail. Um, so Virgin Media Business um, were contracted in, in February 2020 to start deploying around 1600 sites with dark fibre connectivity. Predominantly they were all single connectivity, but there was some that had dual connectivity and they all go back to 34 uh, what we call fibre service nodes. So those fibre service nodes are actually located in BT open reach exchanges. Uh, and then we have some fibre interconnectivity between those uh, BT exchanges to create a number of fibre loops around the city region. The type of sites that are actually connected to that dark fibre network range from um, kind of traditional council offices, but also include uh, health sites and the combined authority actually has the GM fire rescue service as part of it. So all of the fire stations across the city region are connected. A large number of transport sites, so Metrolink, bus depot, bus stations, um, but also urban traffic control signals as well spread across the city region. We're also connected to a number of uh, police stations, leisure centres, etc. So a very wide area, different types of, of network. And as I say, that, that all of those 1600 sites connect back to uh, exchanges that sit in nine out of the 10 localities. The sites actually sit in all 10 uh, local localities that make up the city region. And as you can see there, all of those sites are resiliently connected with, with Dart 5 to establish that network. So I was pleased to say that we're, we're coming to the end of the LFFM programme now. So after just under two and a half years, the majority of those 1600 sites are now in the ground connected and, and ready to be lighted. So about Three years ago, we, when the LFFM programme was was just uh, starting out, we started to look at how we could look at making best use of this fibre network across the city region. 
So we came together and looked at whether there was an opportunity to collab to light it with a number of the local authorities under what we're calling GM1 network. And we've already got four of the local authorities together with the Fire and Rescue Service and TFGM agreed to connect 1200 of those sites as a single programme. And the aim is to leverage that investment in that dark fibre and bring wider benefits. And what we really want from GM1 network is for it to be the network of choice uh, in public sector across the city region. And what we're doing initially is, is really lighting that fibre, but we're really looking at creating a platform that we can build on, both within buildings, so looking at land, Wi-Fi, zero trust capabilities, but also looking at this being a platform for next generation networks, being able to look at research and development, particularly around things like 5G and advanced wireless capabilities. But the key thing is that it becomes that network that public sector can trust, can collaborate on and can have fast connectivity between the various offices. And the ultimate aim is for anybody to be able to walk into any office and have connectivity to their home networks. And just looking at this from a high level perspective, uh, so very much developing blueprints around in-building connectivity, looking at wireless first capabilities for things like wireless Wi-Fi 6, very much a network platform and automation. Uh, so we'll, we'll hear about how we're using uh, ServiceNow as a platform to actually drive the software defined network, both in an underlay and an overlay capability. And then we're looking at consolidated it access to internet services so we're not having multiple internet connectivity and then looking further forward secure cloud connectivity as well that's embedded right into the core of the network and it's all a fully managed platform as well so a single organization can manage this on behalf of the collaborative or collaboration and we're at a really exciting point in this programme where we're appointing our partners uh, to actually help us deliver this. And we've been working very closely and appointed uh, Cisco and Cisco customer experience to help us actually drive this network forward with a 10 year strategic relationship. We're also working with Engage ESM who are delivering our ServiceNow platform uh, that's going to really be the, the single pane of glass into all of this network automation. Uh, Virgin Media 2, as I said, we're heavily engaged over a 30 year program now with um, the LFFM program. And we've also got talents providing uh, an initial managed service around GM1 network. On that basis, what I'd like to do is to bring uh, some of the colleagues that we've been working with uh, onto the call uh, where we're going to hear their views um, of uh, what we're doing with GM1 Network. Uh, so Adrian, Stu, Murray, if you can bring yourselves in and off mute. Uh, and we've got a few questions. If I can stop sharing. Morning guys, um, do you want to just introduce yourselves? Sure, yeah, shall I? Uh, I'll go. Um, yeah, my name is Adrian, Adrian Davis. Um, I'm the uh, the head of technology at Stockport Council, uh, one of the partners in the, the GM1 network and LFFN work. And uh, I chair the, uh, the program board, collaboration board for uh, GM1 as well. Thanks, Adrian Street. Yeah, morning everyone. I'm I'm Stu Higgins. I'm the head of Smart Cities and IoT for Cisco in the UK. I'm I'm also a sustainability ambassador for the company. I'm Murray. My name is Murray Atchison. I am the public sector lead at Engage ESM. So looking after organisations, implementing and looking into the future with ServiceNow. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us today. And um, so, Adrian. What's what's been the impact of this LFFM program, particularly in your locality in Stockport? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a widespread impact for, for Stockport. Um, uh, across Stockport, we've we've now got I think just over 130 sites um, connected uh, with dark fibre, uh, and they're distributed right across the borough. Um, and, and as you mentioned in in um, in some of the slides there that they're varied array of sites as well so their um, council offices um, all the library uh, locations um, we've got partner offices connected up as well so Stockport Homes our, our housing partner and totally local company our 
sort of streets and parks um, partner as well. They're, they're connected up and and the large majority of, um, of primary and secondary schools across the region are also connected. So I mean, it's that's that's just quite a lot of connectivity we've got there, um, and you know, I mean, all of those partner organisations across the region that that they're all going to benefit from that sort of that assured sort of long term high quality connectivity, and it's it's a bit it's just like a foundation for Stockport's wider public service, um, so we can sort of develop develop on that, and and really, I suppose as Phil was mentioning, it's not really about the technology; it's about what we do off the back of it. So it's looking towards putting those future facing digital services out there, and this this is the sort of foundation for that. Yeah, and of course we've got fire and rescue sites in the same locality, transport sites. So you kind of really see that coming together, don't you? Uh, of different organisations in in GM. Uh, so Stu, you know how how can smart cities help address the digital divide and and social isolation in in a city region? Nice easy one. I to think start Adrian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Adrian mentioned it. I think I, going back to the video, Andy and Phil summed it up perfectly. You know. In my words, not theirs, but creating that more joined up, caring, inclusive community. And, and the really exciting thing for me is that the infrastructure you guys are putting in across the region gives you a chance to ask a really interesting question, which is that if you had pretty much unlimited secure bandwidth right across the region, how you could redesign and develop new public services in a totally different way. If, if suddenly you take away that excuse, which is, oh, we can't do that because the network's not fast enough, it doesn't do that, it's not secure enough to let people have access from somewhere else, it it totally changes it. And 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 really the important thing is about creating that joined up community, because in, in a lot of cases, the, the, the most poorly served in a community often have the worst, least and most expensive choices. So how do you make it affordable and how does that then lead you into being able to deliver things where you remove hassle from people's day to day lives when when you need to uh, interact with the public sector? It's normally because you have a challenge in your day to day life. It might be about education. It might be something to do with the police. There might be a pothole in your road. Your bins might not have been collected. The air quality outside your kids schools might not be great. And, and and I think people have realised that you need that digital foundation to to help get the data to help improve all of those things. And and for me, it's really about joining people up. You know, my mum and dad live a couple of hundred miles away from me. Digital technology enables me to know that they're okay. And I think if you can do that across the the nearly three million people across your region, that's really exciting. Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting. I mean, we've seen con consumer use of I, uh, network based video go through you know the, the ceiling i know cisco have talked around the amount of video over the last decade that's going to steadily increase and i think as public sector organizations we probably questioned whether that would ever happen but we've seen over the last two years here yeah, we all are now streaming high quality video from home stroke offices so yeah it's it's, it's definitely you know in the public sector just gone from very little to to you know being a, a life necessity murray uh, how do you see platforms like service now changing the way uh, orga organizations manage their their digital landscape moving forward yes yeah, so service now is goal and it's and it's mission statement is how how can we make work work right so that's that's crucially what it's trying to achieve so these low code no code platforms that are rising right and they're rising on the basis of um businesses and organizations looking further and further of not what we can do in IT, but how we can also support other business processes outside of that, right? And how do we digitize them? Because if we can digitize them, we can make them more accurate, we can make them more automated and promote automation, and we can create audibility as well, right? How can we say that we've done something where we've done it and how we've done it off the back of that? Good example of that is some of the work Affinity Water are doing in their customer impact tooling uh, part of ServiceNow at the minute where they need to um, provide to the um, powers that be really if, if, if a water pipe breaks somewhere how did we track it how did we route the work how long has that taken they've got eight hours to do it or else we get fines from the governing bodies and how can we provide an order over the background right so it's business processes like that that come into it because if we can start using Platforms like ServiceNow is the orchestrator of these end-to-end -end processes, and so we can manage all that data and manage all that work there. 
and um, we're going to be much more efficient and effective in the way we do that. And the other the other side of that is the is the new sort of customer centric approach that we're all expecting and seeing, right? So what we what we see in Amazon and Netflix and when I order a Domino's and I can see the pizza's in the oven and when it's coming down the road, right? We're expecting that more and more in the workplace. Um, and that's that's the other side of things in terms of how we're looking at that digital landscape from now. And that that leans into doing what we're doing with you guys, right? How are we providing a consumer grade approach for people to consume the GM1 products and networks and all that good stuff out there in an end to end automated auditable process that sits there in a scalable way? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Particularly low code, no code. Uh, has, has taken off significantly over the last three or four years. And it's interesting where the different providers have come from as well, you know, the different solution platforms. So Adrian, I mean, how do you see the, the, the impact of that digital infrastructure automation from a, from a local authority perspective? Yeah, I suppose that, well, in my mind, I, I maybe think it's sort of the digital Network infrastructure automation is, is sort of like the, the next big thing after sort of data center automations, perhaps it, in a way that sort of data center infrastructure moved away from that sort of legacy storage area network stuff to more converged and hyper converged and, and then hybrid on prem setups and that, that, that sort of thing. And it, it's about taking those sort of big, gnarly, expensive legacy areas of organizational infrastructure like the data center or the network um, that are essentially sort of well, they're sort of ring fenced sort of legacy areas and they're a bit insular and it's taking those and opening them up and reducing the complexity, increasing the functionality, you know, and also it allows the staff that be focused on maintaining that stuff and, you know, and sort of increasing the availability to sort of focus on delivering real value and services to customers, uh, sort of facing them outward and, and, and focusing on delivering that value around, around security, increased speed of change, you know, cross organizational sort of collaboration and partnerships, data and network service sharing. You know, there's so much going on there. We've had a taste of that within the Stockport region around our health and social care um, work that we've been doing over the past few years. Done some great work around sharing Wi-Fi services between an Aruba and a Cisco network across the Foundation Trust and the Council so we can get SSIDs for each of the networks in different locations across GP surgeries, the hospital, council locations. Great work, really valuable for, for all staff and delivery of health and social care services, but that ain't scalable. That's we've, we've had the benefit, but it's not scalable in the sense that we're talking about here with sort of GM1 uh, and working off the LFFN infrastructure. So, you know, there's all of that sort of stuff that that's absolutely possible and you know i mean software defined networking that automation orchestration it's 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 a very exciting space just now yeah thanks adrian uh, and Stu, how do you see the acceleration and transformation of enterprise networks post pandemic we've all been sat at home for the last two two and a half years and then all of a sudden there's going to be this semi influx i would say uh, back into the office how, how do you see things changing I, I think that's it. There's a there's a massive we're seeing a massive pent up demand. Suddenly, people are, are they've realised they can work in different ways. They, there's got to be a provision for making a change to support um, a very very different working environment and and a different way of delivering services. And uh, you you know I think people have realised that digital underpins a lot of the outcomes that that you're trying to get to and you guys are, are ahead of the game because you're sort of two years down that track you've got fiber right across the region which is a brilliant start and then you can build layers on top of that with with things like automation and and the security and access to all services from everywhere and the really important thing about being able to answer the question what if i want to do x when people haven't thought up what that x might be yet but you you've got to a platform in place where you can pretty much guarantee you're going to be able to say yes we think we can do that we might need to make a few changes but actually most of what we need is already there and I, I think that things are faster than they were they're more secure they're more intelligent you can do more automation and, and something that that's really changing as well is is predictable uh, or predictability where there might be issues coming to some part of the network so how can you um head those off at the past before they turn into a problem that stops an application working. So can you monitor something that says, hey, look, what if there's going to be a problem halfway around the world that might affect our service delivery? 
so it's how you bring all that together and, and yeah it's, it's changing it's really exciting there's also been a big technology shift in the last couple of years so uh, you mentioned it at the start john this is this is a real next generation infrastructure that you're building and it'll support what you want to do i think for the next 10 years at least i hope so <laughs> we've got that 10 year strategic relationship so yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Murray, do you have any examples of, of how digital automation, low-code platforms have, have really helped organisations become more digital enabled during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic's right at a very scary time, but also an exciting time for digital businesses like us when we're like, well, how can we help? How do we jump in here? So there's a whole range of where we've jumped in and where ServiceNow is supported to do that, right? And how platforms like ServiceNow can achieve it. So. Um, whether that's some of the simplest stuff in terms of right, our, our workforce has just removed to remote overnight. I mean, we were working with a large bank where they had 3,000 people in an offshore site who were inside one day and offshore and off off site the next. Right. So how can we collect all that data and that information and the addresses and the hardware required and all of that to get out there? And it's that sort of process and that amending that was required in that time. Right. So. That was that was one exciting bit. I mean, the the other side of it is again, it's it's business processes that we're here to address. It's not just the IT landscape. So, how when we're when we're coming through that pandemic, how how do we know our employees are ready to come back? How are we surveying them? How how are we health screening them to say, well, have you had a negative test or whatever it might be or whatever the processes are in your organisation? But when we get to the workplace, how do we know how many desks we have? How is that spread out? How how do we know if 50 people are coming in or 10 people are coming in? And what the PPE requirements going to be for that? Do we does every do we need? If we've got 100 people coming in. Do we need 100 sets of gloves and 100 masks or whatever it might be from there? Right. So workplace strategies are ever changing now as we sort of move into this semi remote work anywhere. Come back a bit. People like to come back in there. That 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 strategy needs to change. It needs to evolve with it. I think that the the best and the most pertinent example in the pandemic time would be NHS Scotland. So they they use the ServiceNow platform to develop and create all of their test and protect programs or all of their vaccine management programs because it was seen as that platform that they can build quickly, efficiently, and crucially scalable on that side of things. And that that all happened back in the G GMCA and the GM1 program and all that side of things. That something will come up. We can't foresee, don't foresee, haven't considered all the rest of it. It's it's platforms like this that we can be scalable and move at, move at a rate of pace to fix those in a quick manner. Yeah, let's just hope it's not another pandemic uh, <laughs> that pops up. Obviously, but uh... yeah, we've done that one, haven't we? Um, <laughs> so, actually, I mean, I mean, obviously, talk about the pandemic. How how do you think your networks are going to have to adapt to kind of post-pandemic working patterns? Yeah, um, oh, certainly adapt required. And, and well, Murray was just giving me the shivers there, taking me back to. So having to flip from a, a, a predominantly office based organisation, um, you know, two and a half thousand employees with capacity for about 200 home workers into fully home working within the first two weeks of me taking the job, which is a, that, was a, <laughs> that was a thing. But, you know, we've all got that lived experience, haven't we, within our organisations. We've all had something like that and we're dealing with enormous change, but importantly, a really super fast pace. You know, there, there was no time. It had to be done. And you know what? I think. You know, everybody coped super well with that. They actually, we did this stuff and, you know, look back on that and, you know, everybody should be patting themselves on the back. It, we, we really did well. We held the organizations together and we delivered those services. And I, I think post um, post pandemic, the working patterns and the network and the, the, the services we've got to put in have got to reflect that speed of change and that opportunity to do things differently at scale you know, really quickly. I think organisations expect that now. They're seeing it can be done and, and that's just the expectation. So the network needs to adapt to make sure we can provide those high quality connect connectivity, those services, be flexible to stand up locations perhaps and use our office space and, and estate management in different ways at pace and at scale. So I think that that's what the network's got to do going forward. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, obviously we're speaking from kind of a local authority perspective, but I think seeing what happened in health was really interesting as well. The amount of people that the health sector had working from home 
uh, which was you know pretty much unheard of you know in a, particularly in the health sector when you get into nhs trust so that they just expect everybody because that's the way things have to be on on site and, and it's proven that that's not had to be the case you know so you know, look at the number of medical iot devices that have, have been deployed um over the pandemic in particular and you know the, the shift in the way that that health is delivered i mean how how do you see that developing what what's going to be the biggest challenges or, and, and opportunities moving forward around that space yeah i, I, I think there's a, there's a few challenges one of the biggest is is uh, people sticking with the change i, I mentioned my folks earlier today uh, they had a message from their doctor saying, right, all our appointments are now face to face again. And my head hit the table. It's like, what, what a miss, what a missed opportunity to deal with people like us that maybe don't need to go in and let my 80 year old parents go to the doctor's surgery if they need to. It's, it's really frustrating. But I, I think, you know, the devices need connectivity at, at, at a very basic level. They need good quality, secure connectivity because it's not just about getting data out of the devices, but it's also protecting those corporate networks from those devices. So you don't want a device to get onto your network that might be an entry point for somebody to hack into the corporate HR database, for instance. So how do you create an environment where you can bring all those sensors and all that benefit in, but make sure you protect both sides and patient data and talking of patient data, how do you make sure you can share access to the data that's necessary across multiple different disciplines in healthcare to enable better, more joined up care? But, but I think the, the, the real big thing is this is about helping people get better more quickly in a place that helps them heal faster. So the challenges are about cyber and about getting data to places, but the opportunities are massive about how can I get home more quickly and recovering a in a place that suits me and how can I continue care beyond a medical facility and how can I get updates all the time so instead of taking blood pressure twice a day what about if I'm wearing a smartwatch that enables that to be updated to my doctor if there's an anomaly so I think being able to join things up being able to find stuff there's massive problems in hospitals of just knowing where things are from crutches to beds and everything in between and, and you can do that with technology and, and the and the other thing is about moving data to people if you've only got a couple of very very expensive highly trained medical specialists you want to be able to deliver data to them so they can help as many people as possible not need them to go to a particular place to to be able to administer that care yeah absolutely i mean we know the text out there it's, it's sat on your wrist right now isn't it um, yeah, i think yeah. part of the challenges is around standards as well though isn't it an, an interaction between different uh pillars of, of technology uh, and we certainly yeah. see that across the city region and trust um, as well how do you create yeah. that trust yeah and it goes back to one of our digital priorities you know empowering people you know it's very much about putting those those end users and the end citizens in in control of both their data and the, the services they consume. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, Murray, um, just kind of last question for yourself. You know, the world of work's changing. You know, there's a lot of remote working now. How are platforms like ServiceNow supporting that? Yeah, I mean, we, we touched on it a fair bit earlier in terms of um, there is this work from anywhere approach now, right? We're, we're constantly changing our strategic strategy in terms of who's who's coming in, who's not coming in, who doesn't want to come in. And to, to use another buzzword, I mean, there's the Great Recession going, oh, the Great Recession, the Great Resignation, my apologies, going around at the minute. So recruiting and retaining talent is becoming ever more important than it ever was before, right? So there's, there's two core sides of it to me, really. One is once we have people, our environment, um, how are we onboarding them quickly? How are we getting them all the information, assets, equipment that they need, information around HR and all that stuff, meeting their teams in a fast, efficient, streamlined manner, right? Because the quicker they can onboard themselves, the quicker they can start driving value back to an organisation. But the quicker those processes are for them as well, right? In terms of they, we want them spending as little amount of time doing mundane tasks and as much time doing value add interesting activity for the organization, right? So that's that's where this sort of fits in and platforms like ServiceNow do that. The, the second part of that is, well, now that we've got different teams working in lots of different areas and some are in the office and some are at home and some are in different geographies now because we can do that a lot more easily because 
Murray likes to work from a beach in Spain every now and again, whatever it might be. Um, how do we still ensure that there's collaboration going on between the different parts of the organisation, right? How are we routing work effectively at the right times in the right areas and allowing the collaboration between? So, and we, we're doing things like integrating into obviously Teams and Slack and Outlook and all those different areas to allow quick collaboration, following a process, following a workflow, tracked and audited throughout it um, to help us respond to that, to help us respond to that work anywhere. And again, it's 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 looking at what you guys are doing, right? So we're, we're supporting the breakdown of silos through end-to-end -end process and tying all of our different systems, teams, partners together in one effective place. And as, as you said at the very start, John, into a single pane of glass. So we have all that information. Thanks, Murray. Uh, we did get one question through the chat as well from Mike. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll start to answer this and, and then if anybody wants to join in afterwards. Um, so Mike's asking, uh, how are you dealing with identity management, joining all these services together, which is a great question. Um, it's always a bit of a challenge. You know, First of all, you need connectivity and then you need to know who the people are that are accessing these services. The key thing with what we're doing with GM1 is, is is maintaining sovereignty of each organization through the network. Uh, so we're not creating a single kind of internet equivalent network. We are maintaining those, that segregation. But the key thing is because we're on the same bit of wire, it makes that integration a, a hell of a lot easier within a site or within the core for accessing services that are shared. We are, it's a separate topic really, uh, but we have something called the, the GM digital platform that we're launching a number of kind of pan Greater Manchester initiatives on uh, and within that is a componentized platform and within there we've got something called GM identity and what that allows us to do so ServiceNow will be, will be plugged into this for the various partners that are accessing that, that single network uh, platform it allows us to provide role-based access at a single location in the centre but using existing uh, solutions on premise so um, things like Azure AD matching that through and um, so it's, it's certainly something we can do on, a, on another topic but yeah we, we've got that capability at the city region to be able to do that kind of federated identity access management solution around specific uh, new technologies like ServiceNow that we bring in at a GM region. Yeah yeah I mean it's it's all about a best practice best practice uh, process that sits along the top right but an individual experience as we get down to the layers so yes we're still going to have those individual experiences for everybody coming through but it's as you say how do we get it on that single wire and ensure we have a consistent effective approach to responding to them as well. Yeah great and just a couple of questions for everybody really and uh, and please come in um, so what do you think the role of digital is in attaining sustainability and meeting carbon reductions targets? You know, in GM we've got 2038 uh, that Andy's set as a as a carbon neutral for the whole city region. Um, where's the where's digital place in all of that? I, I think a, a, a lot of that is about um, you know cities are responsible for 70% of greenhouse gases and buildings in cities for 20% for so it's absolutely the right place to be looking and 2038 is not far away so green technology is really important I know I know you guys are already using 100% renewables for your tram system and you know data centers are a big user of energy you've got to make sure renewables are used wherever you can and then you've got to look at things like circular economy so are, are the providers of all sorts of services and, and things into into the region are they designed to be modular, to be recycled, to enable easy reuse? That we we've got a program where we'll take back for free any Cisco equipment, and we'll we are at the moment where recycling, reusing, or repurposing about ninety nine point nine percent of that gear that we're getting back. So it's making sure that we can enable you to hit your targets and help you monitoring them and, and, and make sure that every new piece of technology is designed from the ground up to be modular so you only replace the bits you need you don't use paint when you don't need to you package it in recyclable materials and so right through logistics and every part of the supply chain you've got to hi everybody to and thank you for joining us i'm just going to wait about and, and then, of course, there's, there's hybrid working. You can make a massive din in carbon um, footprint by enabling people to work in a different way. You don't need to travel. You don't need to heat or cool buildings. And then, then something that I think is really interesting 
changing the colour and temperature of a light, you can make people think it's a little bit cooler or warmer. So using technology, you can change the perceived temperature of a building and therefore save a little bit on heating or cooling in summer and winter by using tech in a, in a more imaginative way. So there's loads of different things I think you could do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a really exciting time at the minute in terms of the, the carbon footprint, right? The carbon reductions, the social value, and all those things are more and more of a differentiator for us working with like public sector organisations. And that, that, that drives down through behaviours, right? And through through the ways we react. I mean, service now has been carbon neutral since 2021 and it's, it's on the front of all the marketing, right? We, our slides are all black now because black slides consume a lot less energy than white slides as it runs through, right? So uh, digital has a huge role in playing to that, but also so just differentiating ourselves to support as a wider sort of social value that sits around that. Yeah, we, we, we're actually, we, we're, we're at a stage that's really interesting where we've got some customers admittedly in, in the Nordics at the moment that they're now saying unless your purpose matches ours we don't care if you give us the technology we won't choose it if you're not aligned from a sustainability and social perspective to us so I think there's a real shift in in how people are buying as well because they're looking at different things as being really important in that buying process. Yeah I'd, yeah. I'd also sort of go into the aspect from so the digital inclusion aspect you know for for citizens across greater manchester um i think annie was mentioning that in, in the in the video at the beginning you know if you don't have access to digital services then you, you're going to spend more it, you're going to be disadvantaged but you're also going to have less choice you're not going to have the choice to choose the the thing that will help um, reduce emissions you know that that's just not going to be there to you so you know it this whole digital inclusion, access to digital services, climate action, it, it, it's really, it's really closely entwined. Absolutely, I think, you know, particularly with what we've done with the LF FM programme and with, with the GM1 network contract, you know, the amount of social value that's, that's pumping through both of those contracts is, is in the region of 30%, which is normally only seen in the construction industry, you know, so I think, you know, hats off to, to Cisco and, and Virgin Media O2 for, for bringing that level of, of social value commitment to the city region, which is, you know, really important looking at it from, you know, digital inclusion in, in particular and the sustainability, you know, Andy's got digital inclusion as a top five mayoral priority now um, and that's because of the pandemic you know it, it really came to light the amount of challenge people had with connectivity sharing mobile phones between a family of five trying to homeschool you know in some of our, our less deprived you know our most deprived areas so you know it's you know, we we're just launching the GM data bank um, alongside the national data bank and we're relaunching our, our tech fund as well, you know, really to get industry to help um, those that are most in need with, with digital solutions, which, you know, is, is only going to be a benefit for everyone because it, it, it develops that that talent pipeline, you know, if they've got digital skills early on, then they're more likely to look towards digital industries further down the line, which, you know, we, we know we're a big challenge for, for all of us in recruitment and retention. Uh, I think we're, we're kind of coming up to time there. Um, I'd first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Adrian, Stu and Murray for, for joining me today uh, and going through. And I think, hope everybody listening now or, or on the recording and, and enjoyed what we, we talked about today. Uh, and there'll be a lot more coming out over the, the coming months around some of the great things that we're doing in, in Greater Manchester around network automation and platforms. But thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks all. Thank you.